Welcome, this is Luke Smith, RealVacantLand.com. I'd like to start out by saying, um, I'm making this video for Dan P. He's a good friend, mentor of mine, great sounding board when I have ideas or new sales pitches and things. I like to bounce them off of Dan and he, he points out the problems and how to make them better, right? And so it's a great uh, um, partner to have in, in those kinds of regards. So thank you, Dan. And uh, I, uh, I also wanted to kind of convert this video into commercial land lessons learned. So this is, I had a popular video in the past that was more of me venting about lessons learned and things that were had gone wrong in different uh, real estate trades that I was into or had been into. And the videos of lessons learned have gotten longer and longer, right? Um, so <clears throat> back to the lessons learned topic. This one is on uh, commercial uh, commercial real estate. And so as COVID happened the last couple of years, I had a lot of properties that were rural vacant land, classic rural vacant land, middle of nowhere, you know, great place to put your RV and go for it or something, right? Um, or homestead, a new ranch or those, those kinds of properties. And uh, had, them, had them well stocked and the shelves were just full and everybody wanted to get out of the house and go somewhere and they bought those things. And it was really hard to get more of them. The price went zing. And um, people got back to me and then said they resold the ones they bought for me for double or triple or sometimes five times what I sold it to them for. <laughs> it just makes me feel like an idiot, but it's I'm happy that they're able to do that too. Um, so <clears throat> it's really hard to go get more of those properties and restock the shelves. I'm just not willing to pay the prices in today's market. So I've been looking in, at, at other angles. And I think the technology has been getting a lot better in lots of different ways, but especially in the real estate space of high traffic uh, retail locations. You can, you can see people's comings and goings through their cell phone traffic and studying their patterns of where they shop, where they eat, where they live, where they work. And you, the data sets of that start predicting like if these four or five shops are there and people have all these other statistics going about them, the sixth and the seventh and the eighth shop that are missing would do really well there. And you can build a financial model of like how much business they should do in those locations. And so I like the data approach of that kind of information. And I thought if we could get pieces of property that fit those bills of who and figure out who goes here, we could pitch them to those companies that should be building their shops there or franchisees of those companies that should be building their shops there and making them happen. Now we started buying some of those properties and some of them did really well. They flew off the shelves. They paid lots of bills. They made lots of money for everybody that was involved. They used partners on a lot of these deals and um, they're great. Other ones didn't work. And uh, I thought at some price they would, but really they're about finding the right tenant, the right user, the right end business that goes on those properties and doing a build to suit or a ground lease. Like, you know, say, Hey, what do you want? You want a McDonald's? Okay. Here's a McDonald's rent it to you for the rest of forever or something like that. Or a build to suit like, Oh, you want a bank? I'll, uh, or let's no a ground lease. So a ground lease. Okay, Mr. Bank, you want to build your new bank branch on the property? You've got all kinds of money and credit better than I do. You want to, you finance it and build it, and just uh, rent the property from me for the rest of forever. Um, there's those kinds of plays, or just buy the land from me and move on. So, been going through lots of those those deals and the data and statistics and approach of trying to find those tenants for those properties is been my major learning curve. Uh, the last couple of years working on this and learning and, and adjusting and um, spending lots of time and lots of money and lots of energy uh, trying to land those tenants. And along the way, I talked to lots of brokers and lots of players and, and industry makers in that space, and they all have the same kind of tune and rhythm. The buildings are faster, the buildings are easier, and the buildings are where you want to be. And so the same data approach applied to buildings makes a lot of sense to me. And so we've been moving into different buildings, um, like single tenant buildings, like QSR, quick service restaurants, or, you know, like a fast food, a drive through or a, um, those kinds of buildings. So starting on the smaller end of these, these, cause they're easier to finance and, and, uh, play with, if you will. Um, so we've been doing that and we've been putting them into, um, 
you know, selling them, looking for tenants in different ways. Usually the tenants just want to buy the building when I look for a tenant or if I try to sell the building, they want to rent it, you know, classic. And figuring out that we could have them in the auctions at the same time. We could be running them in the auctions and the auctions come to an end date a much sooner or, uh, you know, they have a timeline on there that helps in negotiations to make the thing happen if nobody signs leases and it just gets bought up in the auctions and goes. So those are fun too. And watching the auctions, watching hundreds and hundreds of auctions and recording auctions, um, because all the data disappears right at the end of the auctions. Um, So I've been recording them and databasing lots of them and and learning from lots of these auctions and participating in lots of the auctions. That uh, I think boiling it down, my favorite piece of of those auctions are the value add retail kinds of auctions, Um, like a like a building um, that if you added a tenant it would be worth more or if you changed out the facade of it or you re-gutted it, moved, redesigned it a little bit so it's more modern to sell whatever the next brand is that wants to sell their stuff there, it's worth worth more money. So I think a lot of the value add stuff going through the auctions seems to be a, a more fun play um, either on the sell side and if you're on the buy side too. So a lot of people show up to those auctions um, a lot of people show up to the hotels, the hotel auctions. There's lots of hotels going through the big com- commercial auction houses right now, too. And the main auction houses I've been watching are are uh, Crexi and 10X, um, C-R-E-X-I, Crexi.com, and 10X, T-E-N hyphen X.com. And um, today is Monday. I believe they both have auctions. I know at least Crexi has auctions this week. Um I think 10X is next week. They might be offset. They usually go off on Wednesdays, sometimes Wednesdays and Thursdays. And um, so if you haven't watched those auctions, it's a lot of action there. A lot of people say commercial real estate, that takes forever. Not when you hit the auctions, there's a timeline (laughs) and it's done. Um, So that solves a lot of that problem. So a lot of hotels go through there. A lot of um, talking to different brokers and things, they say multifamily would go through there pretty easily too. And I see some multifamily and retirement homes and stuff like that. They seem to get lots of bids and go through there pretty easily. But talking to the brokers, it seems like they can usually sell those things without paying the auction fees, um, sometimes even faster than, than running them through there. Uh, the same with like single tenant retail, the ones that are leased out selling on like some kind of cap rate. Uh, the brokers can usually sell those things faster than running them through the auctions and without the fees. Um, industrial, lots of the industrial assets, the brokers seem to go find buyers for those before they run them through the auctions too. But they, the multifamily and industrial, when they go to auctions, they seem to go go pretty well, as well as a single tenant retail stuff that's, that's fully leased up or rented up and just going for cap rates. Those go pretty good through the auctions, but they don't always need need to like i think they can go in the traditional markets too so just comparing contrasting i think the sweet spot in there my favorite asset class are the um the value add retail i'm just i just keep looking at my notes if you wonder why i'm looking at my toes or something <laughs> um i think data in that space is pretty sweet i was leading to the the cell phone traffic of new technologies that we have to slice and dice and understand that space um and so then I wanted to get into how do we find good ones? Uh, I, um, I've been looking at lots and lots and lots of them. I thought maybe I'd jump into, um, maybe I have an example here. So this is Crexy.com's website. And if the search is, yeah, the search is up there in the top. And maybe I can make this a little bit bigger. Um, so I just, I just type Chipotle in there and Chipotle starts coming up and, uh, you know, here's a Chipotle asking 4.12 cap and, uh, you know, 5 cap or something, um, different kinds of cap. Here's a 5 cap, 5 cap. Um, yeah, there's, so there's, there's, there's lots of these. There's brand new ones. People are building them. So they took land and they're building a Chipotle and they're um, selling it as a, a rented out building or soon to be rented out building and running. This particular one that I just pulled up here in the background, they're asking a 4.45 cap and they've got an NOI. The number is falling off the screen, but it's 117,000. And so Dan Dan keeps asking what all these terms mean. And that's part of what I wanted to put this video together for and get into this. And so I'm gonna get into some of those numbers 
And then we're going to use the logic of that to go help answer my previous question to myself. How do we find good ones? Um, so here's an example. I'm going to, let's, I should just, I just clicked on this one. I, this one's been on the market for 44 days. So the cap rate's 4.45, 4.45. What is that? What does that mean? That means they've got a price over here too. So we can do the math off of that to get the NOI. And what is NOI? It's net operating income. That's the rent. And um, this is, uh, it says up here, the lease type It's kind of fallen off the screen. It says absolute NNN. And that's the lease type. And what does that mean? Okay, so I'm going to go through some uh, commercial real estate vocabulary. And um, I assume you guys know this stuff, but I'm just going to explain it in my words because, you know, it helps me to try to explain stuff to as well. So absolute triple net. The beauty of owning a property like this is you could buy in this time, this lease type. And this lease type is created for a passive investor, somebody who doesn't want to be active in the operations of this Chipotle. They don't want to take out the trash. They don't want to fix the toilets. They don't want to fix the roof. They don't want to pay the taxes. They don't want to pay the insurance. They don't want to pay all the bills and the power and the sewer. And those bills always go up over time, right? And they don't, they don't want to have to calculate what they're going to be. They just want to get the rent. And so they'll do a deal. And on this particular one, let's see if they say the rent goes up 10% every five years. Okay, so they bump up the rent some over time. Every, every five years, the rent goes up 10%. Um, and so if the person was to come buy this thing at the asking price of 2.6 something million dollars, they would get a two or they would get a 4.45 cap. Let's play with the calculator. And um, so let's say it was a, let's say we just knew what the, because lots of times they don't tell you all the numbers. So two, six, four, two, six, nine, seven. Okay, so this is the, the price. It's 2.6 something million dollars. So let's times that by point. 0, 0.445. This is 4.45%. So we're timesing it by this number uh, to see what the rent is, the current rent. So the current rent is $117,600. And that's what it says on the screen that, that it kind of falls up. $117,600. So let's use this one as an example. Um, okay, so $117,600 rent. Like, you don't have to pay any other bills. You, if you bought this thing, you'd just be collecting that. To me, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because you could buy a CD from your local bank or credit union or something for probably the same kind of yields. But the CD doesn't go up 10% every five years. The CD doesn't have uh, the real estate to back it up. Some people believe in the real estate more than the bank or the credit union that's, that's issuing the paper. Other creative people look at this location and say Chipotle is here. Maybe in the future, Chipotle goes away and I could replace it with uh, New Age, you know, Chipotle of some kind. And instead of charging $117,000 rent, maybe that later on someday I'll charge $200,000 rent. Maybe the market changes and goes in my favor and stuff. So you might have a couple extra wins to your back above and beyond just the 4.45% cap. The thing's been on the market for 44 days. So maybe this, maybe they're asking a little too much. And maybe somebody offers five cap or a six cap or something. So let's say I wanted to offer a six cap on this, on this building. Like, how would I do that? So how would I offer a six cap? How would I do the math on that? So the rent is 117,600,000. And if I divided that by 0, .0 what did I say? Six, so six cap, we should get a price. If I'm doing my math right, yeah. So then we got a price. So if I wanted to offer a six cap on this building, I would take that rent and divide it by the cap that I want to do. And that's how you can go backwards on it and figure out the price that you would want to offer. So then like if you want to buy it at a six cap, you would offer 1.96 million, you know? So that's, that's how you do the math on that. And so as you start learning the terminology of these and learning how to do the math on these, then you can start playing with vacant buildings. Um, okay, so let's, let's you know, 
back to the question of where do we find good ones? Right now in today's market, there's a lot of Burger Kings amongst others. Uh, Hardee's. Hardee's. There's a lot of Hardee's, vacant Hardee's in the market too. So let's put Burger King on there. And let's, uh, let's add a filter and let's do occupancy, you know, up to 50% or something. Um, and then let's see what happens. We should get vacant ones. Okay, so here's the first one that comes up is asking $2.1 million. To me, it sounds like they want to sell it like it's rented out. Uh, but we'll use this as an example. Uh, so 1973 build. So this is an older building. Well, it's kind of fallen off the screen. But 1973 build. I like, you know, it was, it was renovated in 2008. So maybe it's a little fresher. So they're asking $2.1 million. Okay. It's been on the market for 250 days. Nobody has, has grabbed this one up yet. Um, so what kind of rent would we need to get this building to make sense if we paid the asking price of $2.1 million? Let's play with our math. Um, let's say we got a Chipotle to move in here. And let's use that same 6% make-believe number that we were just playing with Chipotle. And... Um, so let's pull out the calculator. And so if we had $2.1 million purchase price times 0.06, we would need Chipotle. This would be a break even. This is like not paying any fees or anything. Or, you know, when the Chipotle wants to move in, they're going to want a bunch of money to fix it up and make it their color and everything. We would need to, <clears throat> we would need to charge Chipotle $126,000 for this location a year, triple net. And uh, so we need more than that to pay for improvements, to pay for all kinds of, you know, all kinds of things. And six cap might not be the right number either. I mean, so there's, uh, there's an idea. So then we would go look at this current market and see if the markets could withstand that. Is there enough traffic? Is there enough business? Is there enough, you know, what's going on here? Could we go sell Chipotle or someone else on it? Who else could we sell on this? Could we sell, I don't know who, right? Um, let's, uh, let me use an example of a different property I was working on um, of who goes here. And uh, so I had an example. So I, uh, I pulled up BARD. This is Google BARD. This is, you know, how technology is moving forward and being awesome, helping us out, right? Google BARD is a, it's like a chat GPT, but with more relevant new information or chat GPT stopped collecting in, or adding information two years ago or something, 2011 or yeah, maybe, maybe even three years ago. So I like sticking weird stuff in here. Like, look at this. So I put what cap rates are Chipotle restaurants selling for, <laughs> you know? Google Bard comes back and says, Chipotle restaurants are selling for cap rates of approximately 4.5 to 5.5 .5 in 2023. And then they give you all kinds of warnings how they might be off. Okay, so that's part of the equation. Let's say we could talk a Chipotle and going into that empty Burger King or somebody else of who, but who else, right? Who else has the horsepower to go into an empty Burger King like that? Um, there's all, I've, I've got all kinds of databases that of different names of who goes here and, and like, it looks at the other shops and things that are around that property, um, and says they're already there. Let's find somebody else that's not there that off of these, these demographics, this, this, uh, traffic and influence of everything that's happening in this area, these names would do well here and grades them accordingly. And then... There's more to that. Like they have to be able to pay the rent too, right? So let's try a different way of an example. So Chipotle, what is the average unit sales of Chipotle? Okay, so I'm asking Google Bard, what's the average unit sales of Chipotle? And why would I ask him this while it's thinking? 
um, because I want a shop that can pay the rent. And so if they can pay the rent, then uh, they're much more likely and willing to, to rent this thing for the prices we need. And the math that we were doing, we needed, I don't know, what was it? One, did I save it? 120, just to break even, we need 126. So like if we wanted to make some money on top of that, we're gonna need to, we could play with the math and see how much money we wanna make on top of that for pulling it all off and pricing in all the costs. Um, I'm guessing like 150, 175 kinds of numbers or something might start making more sense, like $175,000 a year um, to cover all the costs and everything. So let's, let's say we're trying to target 175,000 a year. Who can pay $175,000 a year in rent? Now, Chipotle comes up. So what's the average unit sales of Chipotle? It was $2.8 million. So this is Google Bards found somewhere in some like public presentations or financials or wherever Google Bard got this. We could ask it where it's getting the information. But it says uh, the average unit sales for Chipotle Mexican Grill in 2022 was $2.8 million. Okay, $2.8 million. So if they've got $2.8 million um, a year for their average location, is our location going to be better than average? Hopefully our location is going to be better than average, and we can look at all the statistics of the shops around there and try to try to understand that. Um, and then if it's better than average, great. If it's less than average, we're going to need room for error to still fit the thing in there. So let's pull out this calculator. And so they've got $2.8 million uh, a year. And the bankers, from my understanding, the bankers like to keep like to finance shops where the rents are below like 10% of the average unit sales. So if we take 2.8 and do, times it by 10%, you can probably do that in your head. We're going to have $280,000. $280,000 a year is kind of what an average Chipotle could pay for rent and still be good with the banks. Now they they might need more room in there to pay like taxes and insurance and you know is that on the 10% side or the not and then you start getting into that dance. Well it's just the more room we give them for air the easier it is going to be to land the sales pitch. So but if this number came out something below that $175,000 we're looking for it's like why are we spending our time trying to rent it to them when they can't even pay the rent, right? So if we target the ones who have the horsepower to pay the rent and we market to those guys, we're going to be um, a lot more accurate at pulling off deals. Uh, so there's there's the idea. Now, like I just put, um, uh, so I just clipped like some other random names for a different property. Whoops. I wanted to do, well, let's try it. What are the average unit sales for yeah let's do that and yeah, we're going to give them too much to work on they're going to get mad at us or something and maybe i have to put commas in there it might work better if i put a bunch of commas um that's not a comma but like uh just wanted to give an example uh, yeah, it got too complicated and they cut me off. Okay, so let's, um, let's do what are, what are the average unit sales of, and then let's, let's just do a couple. And you can ask, like, how many locations do these have? What What are the locations, phone numbers? What are their uh, mailing addresses? What are their, you know, how do I get in touch with them? And uh, you just start following up. I like writing letters. Lots and lots and lots and lots of letters. Personalized, custom letters. Telling them, you know, got the shop for you. Time for you to move in here. Add another one. We'll finance you. 
give you all the money you need to make this happen. And um, they call and then you start negotiating, right? So uh, this thing should grind away. But what I wanted to show you is you can stick multiple names in here and it'll give you the average unit sales. And I wanted to come up with an example. Maybe this list is already curated, but it's not curated for this 175,000. Um, yeah, this one clunked out on me. You get the idea. It works <laughs> when it's, you know, it's finicky. So maybe just do a little bit at a time and then you get lists. I mean, I've stuck lists in there at 20 or 30 at a time and sometimes it works and sometimes the computers are clogged up and you can only do three to five at a time, maybe during more business hours or when more people are using it. Um, it doesn't run as long and try to figure stuff out. But it'll list them out in order of highest average unit sales to lowest average unit sales. And the ones down at the bottom, I mean, they're usually like pizzas or you know a sandwich shop or something. And um, they don't have enough horsepower to pay the rent for a standalone building. But they could, maybe they could take half of the building or we could find a couple of them and cut the building in half. There's a couple different ways of doing it. But uh, they, uh, they like inline spaces like your, your neighborhood shopping center. And um, that's where you see a lot of the pizza places, sandwich shops, and those, those, those kinds of things that don't have enough sales to pay for a whole building of their own, pay the rent on the whole building. And so that's, that's how you can do that math. So Dan was asking how to do the math on some of these. So that's some examples of how to do the math on them and, and check them to go find the right tenants. Um, the brokers make lots of money finding tenants for these things. And uh, there's not a whole lot of information out there, public on the internet, anywhere that I can find or see of how to find tenants for these things. Um, but uh, that's, that's how I like to do it. And um, so I think if I just share a little bit, other people may share some more and come back with more information. I'm always looking for, for questions and answers. Please feel free to put questions and things in the comments. I'll try to get into these deeper. Um, and uh, if, you, if you haven't seen, um, I started a little fund uh, to do these kinds of deals. So if you want to participate in some of these deals, um, I'll put a link in the description below that'll take you to the part of my website. You can sign up to the fund. It just pays like a income over time. And then as deals happen, I kick out extra bonuses and uh, you make you know, money on these deals with me. So I can use part of your money to make these deals happen, to grease the gears and pull them off. And I just send, you know, send out more and send out more and send out more distributions along the way. Um, so there's those. Um, yeah, so, oh, I know, We're, the, that example, let's go back to the 175. So let's say, did I slide that page open? Let's see. So let's say we got that empty Burger King, wherever that one went, this one in Omaha, Nebraska. Let's say we found Ch Chipotle or somebody and they're willing to pay 175. What happens to it at 175? So let's do this one more time. Um, so 175, so if we had $175,000, if we got a lease for 175, um, and we divided that by 0 0.06. I'm using 0 0.06 because we're still sticking to the Chipotle example. Google Bard thinks Chipotle is trading between four and a half and five and a half, but interest rates have gone up. And yeah, you know, I'm just going to put it on the higher end of that range. So six, six cap, um, that would be $2.9 million. So you could you could go back to the markets, you know, buy this thing for 2.1, stick a Chipotle in there for 175 a year, and then sell it for 2.9 something. And Chipotle is going to want some money to go fix it up. So you got to deduct that out of it in between and the transaction costs and things. But there's still, you know, 900 grand or so in there of a spread to, to pull it off in that kind of scenario. Or maybe you have to ask for more, more rent or less rent or or what to go land that sales pitch and, and pull it off. But that's how you could take a vacant building like this one on the screen and go make more than a half million dollars out of it by sticking a tenant in there. Um, there's, there's an example. And, uh, oh, let's, let's, let's do another example. 
let's um okay so let's let's uh um okay so we know so we have all these all these parameters in place right we have all these ideas and then um we're like luke there aren't any more vacant buildings they're all we've tried them all <laughs> we look at them all we're negotiating on all of them whatever like, yeah there's not that many of them in the marketplace right now uh, good ones good looking vacant buildings they just aren't so what do we do how do we go find more well let's uh let's jump back into this and i'm gonna try some try something here um what's a good name let's let's stick to the burger king let's do burger king okay let's let's stick with burger king name and this time let's change the filters to i want highly occupied you know ones that are full and let's do um cap rates you do, do, do let's sort by noi this time okay so we got 200 and man there's a lot of burger kings on the market whoo people are selling burger king they are tired of the name they want out right a whole lot of these are for sale okay so let's do noi low to high net operating income low to high and it's like luke why would you do that don't you want the ones that pay the most rent it's like yeah that would be the best but there's also the opportunity man these aren't burger kings these are something like next to a burger king um so let's go down until we find one that that, that makes sense what is this thing um cedarsville ohio 10 years left, five cap, where is the rent? Where is the NOI? Uh, this one's been on the market too long. Let's find something. Let's, let's go up the ladder a little bit more. So here's a Burger King. It's a big dollar one for a low NOI. NOI, NOI. Um, let's find one that is... Uh, so the idea here is I'm going to find one that's got a really low rent that's in an awesome location. If we find one with a low rent that's in an awesome location, here we go. I don't know if this location's awesome, but let's pretend it is. So this one has an NOI of $57,000. That's pretty low, right? Like the rent is, is not that much. They're asking for a cap rate of 5.3%. Like, you know, come on. It should probably be, they're probably asking too much money. It's why it's been on the market for 107 days. And this location is probably not spectacular. Like, you know, it's in Parker, Arizona. It's not going to be spectacular. I just, I, I've sold land around there. And it's not going to be like your all-star where you want to own your uh drive through for the rest of your life right <laughs> i don't know how better to explain it let's pretend it was let's pretend this was the super duper sweet location in miami or los angeles or new york or something that's like the precipice of traffic coming from every direction and the highest incomes you can ever imagine and let's just let's believe this is a super beautiful location it's trading on a five cap and you're like oh geez that's too much money and maybe a six cap makes more sense or it's Burger King. Maybe it should be more like a seven or eight cap than with Chipotle at a fives and sixes. Burger King should maybe be something higher because so many of them are going out of business recently. Um, why are they going out of business? We can go back to Bard and say, what's the average unit sales? I can spell it right. What are the average unit sales of Burger King? Burger King sales aren't very high compared to others. They're just not. And then, you know, let's let's do what are the average unit sales of Wendy's? So Burger King. Okay, the average unit sales for Burger King in 2022 was 1.4 million. Okay, that's higher than I thought. But uh, 
I thought they were lower than that, but. So let's compare it to a, a Wendy's because one number doesn't mean anything, but in relation to others, it means something, right? So what's 1.4 compared to Wendy's? Wendy's is, I think they're north of two, but let's see. Yeah, $2.1 million average unit sales. Like how cool is that? Wendy's sells a lot more. You go look for empty Wendy's on the market. You're going to count them in like one hand. You look for empty Burger Kings on the market. It's like, oh my gosh, there's a whole bunch of them. Because they're not selling as much as the others. Like they got the shop. Wendy's is probably right across the street from Burger King. Why are they selling so much more stuff out of the same shape looking shop than Burger King? Burger King should up their sales somehow. Whatever Wendy's doing, I mean, they could do better. And you do something like a Chick-fil-A. Um, average unit sales are going to like just make fun of all these. It's like, why is Chick-fil-A growing so fast? Because their average unit sales are rocking because they've got money to pay rent because they've got money to soak up awesome locations. Uh, they're saying Chick-fil-A in, in 20, no, I'm not saying these numbers are always accurate, but it's, this is Google found a source somewhere. It says, 2022, the average Chick-fil-A restaurant generated $8.6 million in sales compared to the Burger King and Wendy's. Like, no wonder Chick-fil-A is growing like crazy. Um, okay, so let me go back to what I was talking about. So let's say we got a, where did that ugly Burger King go? So let's say we got this Burger King that's paying $57,000 uh, a year in rent. And let's say we figured out that Chick-fil-A is not in this town and Chick-fil-A makes eight million or sells $8 million of average sales. Plus they could pay $800,000 a year in rent. Like you're not going to sign that with them, but they've got the room <laughs> in their budget to pay it and still hit all the ratios with the banks. And, um, Let's say instead of you buy this thing on a $50,000 kind of rent and you say, Burger King, your business sucks. Like we'll buy you out, you know, or your lease comes up and when's the lease come up on this one? Um, well, they've got, okay, it's up here. They've got nine and a half uh, years left on their term and then they've got. Yeah, I don't see any options. They, they got nine and a half years left on their term. So maybe you negotiate something for nine and a half years from now, or maybe you talk to Burger King and you go look at their level of business in this particular location and say, geez, you guys are just scraping by. How much money are you going to make in the next nine and a half years? Like we could just give you that now uh, to get out of there, get, a, get go away and uh, put a, a Chick-fil-A here who pays $200,000 instead of the $57,000. And we're talking more than three X. Um, kinds of rents we could get off the property and uh, I'm sure we could price in sending them some money to go away and a new building that meets Chick-fil-A standards and uh, still have room for air and so what would that be let's do some math again so two um, let's say we got Chick-fil-A for 200,000 this is super hypothetical right but 200,000 um, and Chick-fil-A, let's go back, let's make, let's use Bard some more. What, um, what cap rates are Chick-fil-A selling for in 2023? It's going to be some lower number because they're so highly sought after because they make so much money. Their average unit sales per location so much more than these other names that they've got a lot more room for error. So they, 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 they just sell for great rates. Well, this says four and a half to five and a half percent. I mean, you can go look at the markets and look at trades and everything, but let's, let's use the 6% again. So where's my, where's that other? Okay. So 6%. So let's say we got, um, Chick-fil-A and we want to do divided by 0 0.06. And we're, so we're taking the annual rent and we're dividing it by the cap rate of the market of this kind of asset. And we're getting to um, a price of what we could theoretically sell this thing for. 
And so if this trade all lined up and all these hypothetical things were there, which we can find on other properties if we spend more time um, looking, this million dollar purchase, if we bought it at market prices, we could turn around and sell it for $3.3 million, take out the cost of kicking them out and take out the cost of building a new building and um, you know maybe a million to build a building and I don't know, 500 grand or something to kick them out. There's still a nice spread in there. You can do the math. Like you, there, there's, there's those kinds of plays to be had too. And so we could buy these kinds of plays if this was the play, which I don't think this location is sweet enough to do that. But if it was, we could buy this thing at the market cap rates, go negotiate with parties like, like a Chick-fil-A and um, come up with a deal, offer them out of here one way or another. Maybe they're just happy to not have to pay the rest of the, the lease, depending on how you know poor their business might be doing. They might be negative cash flow and just trying to save their name brand. Um, if we do the data right, we target those kinds of locations in good areas. And then um, we do a workout deal and we collect rent while we're pulling this off instead of buying land that's vacant that we have to pay taxes on. These kinds of people would be paying the rent, they'd be paying the taxes, they'd be paying the insurance, and we'd have a, a cash flow or a rent covered land play, if you will. There's lots of ways to do these, do these kinds of deals. Those are the kinds of deals I'm working on in, uh, in the fund. So if you're interested in those kinds of deals and joining me in some of those kinds of deals, please feel free to hit the link down in the description below. It'll take you back to collect some information and I'll talk to you on the phone about it when we can go deeper and, and go make it happen. Um, deal by deal by deal, right? Stack them up and go for it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. This is Luke Smith, RuralVacantLand.com. See you in the next one. Bye.